episode of Words from the Wild. Yes, I am not wearing my KFPL shirt. I am wearing a shirt with a Brachiosaurus dinosaur uh, made into an angel because I thought you, my dinosaur-loving audience, would appreciate that. Before we get started, I want to talk about biodiversity. Biodiversity is the variety of life, or the number of different species that inhabit a particular habitat or ecosystem. While Ontario is a place rich in wildlife, we can't hold a candle to the biodiversity of ecosystems like the tropical rainforest or coral reefs, for example. If you're wondering, the most biodiverse place on Earth is Brazil. To help you understand biodiversity a little better, I've made another science graphic. This one is a graph. If you're not familiar with graphs yet, you'll definitely learn about them in school soon. A graph is a visual, easy to understand way to display your scientific data or show other people what you have observed. I've made a bar graph. Each bar on the graph shows you how many of something. It's very easy for you to see which bar is higher. In this case, my bar graph shows the number of individual species in each group of living things. So let's take a look at the first three. Mammals, you can see, is the smallest bar. There are 6,495 identified species of mammal on Earth. And that's still a lot. That's still more than I could memorize or remember, for example. But it looks pretty small next to birds, which has 18,000 species, and reptiles and amphibians, which has 19,000 species. If you're curious for the breakdown on that, 11,000 of those species are reptiles, about 8,000 are amphibians, most of the reptiles are snakes and lizards, and most of the amphibians are frogs. Actually, 90% of amphibians are frogs. There are a lot of frogs on Earth. But let's see what happens when I add another bar to my graph, mollusks. There are 85,000 estimated species of mollusk on Earth. Doesn't that make all the other bars look small in comparison? 85,000. Remember that mollusks are invertebrates? They include snails, slugs, and cephalopods like the nautilus and the octopus. But just wait, I haven't included the biggest bar yet. Insects. Scientists think there are over one million species of insect on Earth. One million! That makes every other bar on this graph look tiny. Now scientists have had to estimate this. An estimate is a scientific educated guess that biologists have made based on the evidence we already have. So, 6,495 species of mammal versus over a million species of insect. So what can we learn from this? Well, as a very general simplified rule, the smaller life is, the more diversity of species you can see. The larger and more complex life gets, such as with mammals, the less diversity there is room for. And this makes a lot of sense. Think about any given ecosystem. The pond in your backyard, the forest you go walking in. There are more kinds of insects than there are of mammals or amphibians, right? So as you move forward as young naturalists, remember biodiversity and remember to catalog all the life in your environment, not just the big stuff. Oh, sorry, there's a crayfish down here. So to start this episode off, I'm going to be interviewing my mom. I know, I know, everyone in my family has been in Words from the Wild this summer, but for a few months there, they were the only people I could see because of coronavirus. And conveniently, everyone in my family has studied nature. As we wrap up Words from the Wild, my mom is going to be telling us a little bit more about what it means to be a biologist and what kinds of things a biologist actually does in the day-to-day. -day. Are you ready? Let's go. distancing and, and isolating with my parents, and yes, I do have parents, and that's why I'm able to sit so close to my mom here on this sofa. So, mom, tell us, what was your wild job? I worked as a biologist for the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources. And so when you were doing your wild job as a biologist, what kinds of things did you do? What does a biologist do? Well, we did all kinds of different things. Um, I'll just give you examples of some of the ones we did. 
So one of the things was we did a deer telemetry project. So what that means is we were tracking the movements of the deer. This particular group of deer lived in a provincial park and the numbers of the deer were getting to be so high, there wasn't enough food in the park to feed them. Uh -oh. So we were trying to figure out if the deer left the park during parts of the year or if they stayed in the park all year long. So we put these special collars around their neck, it didn't hurt them. And then we were able to track where they went. And it turns out they did stay in the park for most of the time. A few of them left in the winter, but for the most part, they stayed in the park. Um, I also did a lot of wetland evaluations. So we would go to places that are wetlands, so swamps and marshes and bogs and fens. Mostly we went to swamps and marshes and we would walk through or canoe through the wetlands and we would record all the different kinds of plants that we saw and different kinds of animals that we saw. And then we were able to categorize the wetland um, and then sometimes those wetland areas were able to be protected. We also tagged some fish. We did a couple different um, projects where we would actually net some fish. We would take the fish out, we would measure them, we would uh, weigh them, and then we would put a teeny little tag on them. And then we would release the fish unhurt. And then later on down the road, other pr people would take those fish or find those fish and we were able to track the movements of the fish. So where the fish had, had you know, how far they moved, were they staying local, were they going up river a long way, were they going into a lake, and so on. So we were able to, to determine their movement. Uh, another project we did once was we knew that there was a bald eagle nest in a particular area, and we didn't have a lot of good research on bald eagles. So we knew that this nest was active, and we had a team of us get together. One of the biologists actually climbed the tree, and uh, making sure that they were safe from the parent. The parent just came off the nest and just stayed in the area but flew around. And then they carefully would take each baby bird, put it in a burlap sack, lower it down to us. And then when we had the baby bird, we covered its head so it was very calm. And we took a blood sample, we measured it, we weighed it. Um, we were able to determine if it was a male or a female for the most part. And then we tagged it. And then we put the baby bird back in the burlap bag and it went back up the tree to the nest. We did that with all the young in the nest. And then as soon as we left, the mother came back and everything was fine. But again, that would determine where those birds went. If they left that area, if they went somewhere else, if someone else was able to identify that tag on that bird that gave us some more important information. Plus it let us know if the birds were healthy. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, would you say, um, you know, some, some people might think, oh, putting a baby bird in a, in a sack, that sounds really awful, but why, why do you cover a bird's head? As soon as you cover its head, it's calm. Yeah. So. Yeah, it, it was safe the whole time. Um, sometimes you have to do some of those little things just to get the data that you need, but the birds were perfectly fine afterwards. Mm -hmm. So, how important would you say that making observations and recording those observations how important is that to being a biologist? It's very important. Observations are key. Um, I mean, obviously, first you start with a question. You want to know, are these birds moving? Are these deer moving? Start with your question and then think, okay, well, use all those question words. Who, what, where, when, why, how, and then ask the question and then record your observations. And you know, we've learned a lot through biology. Very often, you think you have an idea, you think you know what's going on, then you observe, you get some data, and you're like, oh, that's not what's going on at all and that's okay because that's why you ask questions sometimes you're not right and then you have to figure it out and you learn right. and oftentimes with what you've learned then you can change things up just a little bit maybe to make it better for the animal yes and or to make sure that they are protected in your opinion what is the best part of learning about nature i think for me the best part about learning about nature is being in nature itself we had the opportunity to use all my five senses. I could listen, I could see, I could smell, I could touch, and I could hear. And it was just wonderful to be able to do that for my job. I was so lucky. I have been exploring outside all summer long. I've been hiking, kayaking, swimming, canoeing, and walking with Aspen, my dog. I have lots of wild footage of cool things that I've seen, plants that I've noticed, bugs, amphibians, things that I haven't included in any previous episodes. So, it's time to go into the field one final time. Enjoy!
This looks like a nest that something has dug out, perhaps. Rather than hatching. If you listen this evening, you may be able to hear what I think is a bullfrog call. Hear how loud that is? I wonder if we can find it. Okay, I have located a bullfrog. After much searching for the source of the sound, the difficult part will be getting it on the camera. See it? Oh my goodness, we got it! Let's see if we can wait until it makes a sound. Did you see that? Did you see its throat puff out as it made that noise? Wow. You guys, this is so cool. Alright, I'm approaching a part of the trail at Little Cataraqui Creek where there are often painted turtles basking on a log. So I'm gonna go really slow and see if we can get some. <gasps> Look, there's one. Oh, and it's gone already. It heard me and it jumped in the water. Looks like that was our only turtle today. Sometimes painted turtles aren't afraid and they'll just hang out on a log and let you walk by. But the ones here at Cat Creek seem to be extra skittish. I can never get them on camera. Oh well. Get him. He's cleaning his face or something. This is a damselfly. See, we can tell because the wings are folded up behind its back. This concludes this summer's Words from the Wild episodes. And it may actually conclude Words from the Wild for quite some time because I'm leaving KFPL to go to big girl school. So I hope you've had a wonderful time traveling along with me through Kingston Frontenac this summer, and I hope that it has sparked your curiosity about nature to go and explore it yourself. If you want to learn more, I have a series of YouTube channels that I routinely use to study nature and to help me learn about it, and I'm going to recommend them now to you. National Geographic. National Geographic has a YouTube channel full of educational videos about all of the life on our planet. They also have a website called National Geographic Kids, which is specifically aimed at you guys to teach you about animals, ecosystems, and everything cool that our planet has to offer. I recommend the BBC Earth YouTube channel. BBC Earth is run by the same people that brought us Planet Earth, Planet Earth 2, and the Blue Planet series. And their YouTube channel is full of clips you can't see anywhere else of nature in action. For older kids, I recommend Coyote Peterson's Brave Wilderness YouTube channel, but be warned, his whole thing is that he intentionally gets bitten by the scariest or really dangerous creatures across the planet. His point is to educate us about creepy, crawly, scary things so that we learn about them and we become less afraid. But that said, he does some pretty wild stuff on his channel, and if you're not ready for it, don't watch it, because it might actually freak you out a little bit. 
<laughs> and for the younger viewers, I recommend the Parks Canada YouTube channel, where their adorable little animated beaver mascot takes kids on a journey all across Canada to various national parks, historic sites, and natural environments. And now, remember how we learned that a controversy is when groups of people disagree strongly about something? Well, zoos can be a controversy. But I will say there are some zoos that have really amazing education YouTube channels. Their purpose is to conserve wildlife and educate people about those wild exotic animals. While many Canadian zoos do have YouTube channels like the Toronto Zoo and the Calgary Zoo, there are three YouTube channels that are recommended as like the best zoo channels in the world. And those are the Cincinnati Zoo and Botanical Garden channel, the Australia Zoo YouTube channel, and the San Diego Zoo YouTube channel. So those are, I think, some of the best educational YouTube channels. Of course, if you're particularly interested in reptiles, I recommended Snake Discovery and Clint's Reptiles. Those are excellent as well. Well, that's it for this week and for the whole summer, everybody. If you have any questions that you want to ask me specifically about nature after the summer is over, ask a member of our programming team and I'm sure they would be happy to pass your question on to me. Well, this is it. Stay wild, everybody.